Good morning, congregation. Buana Sifiwe. I trust you are doing well. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Did you have a good week? It's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. Few amens. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. King David said, I was glad and very glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Better one day in the house of the Lord than a thousand spent elsewhere in vanity. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you. Thank you for gathering us in your presence. Thank you for watching over us throughout the week, Lord, and bringing us to your house to worship you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your touch this morning, even in our lives, oh God. I commit myself to you and I pray that your hand will be upon me as I declare your word. I pray for anointing. I pray for divine enablement, oh God, that your word will go forth with power and clarity, oh God, as it should for your honor and for your glory. Blessed be your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We continue with our theme, position for impact. We examined since the beginning of the year, power for impact. How we can have power for impact. More recently, we did examine how we can have healthy relationships in Embrace 2 and the end result of a healthy relationship is actually Christian impact. We are not being healthy in terms of a relationship for the sake of being healthy, but the end product, the end result is impact for the kingdom of God. Today, we will be considering a new series in line with the theme, Position for Impact. We will be speaking to you concerning the subject, how we can position ourselves for greater impact through giving. No amen. If there is any sermon that makes God's people very uncomfortable, it's a sermon about giving. People don't sit pretty in the service when the preacher begins to speak about giving. Something he is after our pockets. He wants money, more money. So people are very uncomfortable when it comes to talking about giving. My prayer and my desire is that through this series, we can turn that which is threatening to become thrilling. The subject of giving need not to unsettle you, need not to make you uncomfortable it should be able to thrill your faith and inspire you to be able to aspire even to serve the kingdom of God through your faithful giving. My desire is that through this series, you will discover the joy of giving. There is joy in giving. My desire too is that you will experience the liberty of giving or liberty in giving. Thirdly, my desire is that you will Break the chains of poverty and lack in your personal life. The best way to break the curse of poverty and lack in your life is not by laying hands on you and anointing you. It's through obedience in faithful giving. When you obey God's express commands, when you obey what God tells you to do, he will do what he has promised to do in your life. The best way we can break lack and poverty in our lives, in our finances, and rebuke the canker worms and the caterpillars and the locusts that eat into our finances is through faithful, obedient giving to the glory of God. And finally, my desire is that we'll impact the kingdom of God through faithful giving. Because faithful giving has profound impact on you, the giver, and on the recipient, and by extension, the kingdom of God. When God's people give faithfully, it has profound impact in the kingdom of God. 
My overall aim is to help you by the help of the Lord to turn some of you who are reluctant, unwilling, or partial givers into cheerful, liberal, extravagant, and hilarious givers. I believe that's going to happen. I really sense deep down in my heart that miracles are going to happen through this series. God is going to turn people's lives around, their finances around. You will never be the same again. He has done it in my personal life, and in the course of time, I'll be sharing my personal testimony, and I know somebody is going to be transformed for eternity. We begin today our series by seeking to understand the meaning of giving. What is giving is our subject of consideration this morning. Next Sunday, we will look at the why and the how of giving. The Sunday after, we will examine the types of giving and will culminate this series by looking at the grace of giving. The grace of giving. I am excited. I sense something special is going to happen here at Sitam Valley Road as we go through this series. I can't wait for the coming Sundays. But today we must lay the foundation for all that we'll be speaking in the coming Sunday. What is giving? In all my studies, I have come across many discussions about giving, types of giving, what we give, but scarcely any definition from a biblical perspective of what giving is all about. And I will attempt, albeit in a feeble way, to describe what giving is all about. According to the dictionary.com, to give is to present voluntarily and without expecting compensation. It is to bestow. Giving also means to pay or to transfer possessions to another in exchange for something. Nipe, nikupe. The complete Christian dictionary defines giving or to give as to cause someone to have or to receive something. It means to pay. From the biblical perspective, this is my personal definition of giving. From the biblical perspective, I can define giving as an act of holy offering oneself, that is, one's body, gifts, and resources to God for his service and for his glory. It goes beyond transfer of funds and resources from the, the donor to the recipient. It entails the giving of the person who is giving to the Lord entirely of his self, himself or herself. Offering your body, offering all that you have to God as a living sacrifice. That is giving. It touches on finances. It also does touch on you as a person. Therefore, giving entails both monetary and non-monetary contribution or giving to the kingdom of God. In this series, I'll be focusing more on monetary giving. I will narrow down the scope into monetary giving. To better understand what giving is all about, I will attempt to explain giving in the following terms. Number one, giving is an expression of our worship to God. Are we together? Giving is an expression of our worship to God. Secondly, giving is an expression of our love for God. Thirdly, giving is an expression of our gratitude to God. And finally, giving is an expression of our faith in God. Are we together? Giving is worship. Expression of our worship to God. Giving is an expression of our love for God. Giving is an expression of our gratitude or thanksgiving to God. And finally, giving is an expression of our faith in God. Let's examine one after the other. Giving is an expression of our worship of God. Now, giving is part and parcel of worship. Practically, in all religions, when men came before the supreme being or before their deities, they came with a gift. 
No one will go to sacred places, sacred hills, or sacred mountains empty-handed. They had sacrifices. They had gifts they brought to their gods, to the deities uh, that be. Also in our traditional African societies, when you went before the king or the paramount chief or wherever it is that governed your community, you could not go empty-handed. You went with an offering or something like chicken or goat or cow, whatever gift you deemed possible to bring before someone who is superior in your community. So in all religions, without exception, there's an aspect of giving to the supreme being, whoever that being may be. So giving is part and parcel of worship. The very first act of giving recorded in scripture is a profound text. It's a story of Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam. Genesis chapter 4 Verse 2 to 5. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked on the soil. Abel was a herder. Cain was a farmer who tilled the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Verse 4. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. He was enraged. He was infuriated, and his face was downcast. You see, giving was not introduced by the law of Moses. Giving was there before the law was instituted. Some people say, I don't tithe because that is an Old Testament practice. You got it wrong. Giving never began with the law. The law only regularized that which was being given before. It brought some form of order and uh, Decency in terms of giving, if you would. Giving was there before the law. And in this text I have read to us, Abel and Cain offered to the Lord. They brought their offering, they brought their sacrifices to the Lord as their expression of worship to God. The Bible tells us that God looked with favor upon whose offering? Cain, sorry, Abel, not Cain. He looked with favor on whose offering? Abel. Cain's offering or gift or sacrifice did not find favor in the eyes of God. Now, there has been a lot of debate on what went wrong with Cain. Some people have argued it's a type of sacrifice he brought to God. He offered grain offering from his farming activity instead of bringing a blood sacrifice. Some have argued because Abel brought this, that the blood sacrifice, his sacrifice was pleasing to the Lord and Cain should have brought a blood sacrifice. That is oblivious of biblical understanding. God expects you to give what you have, not what you don't have. I believe the secret of Abel's success, let me twist it around. The, 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 the secret of Cain's failure is hinted in this particular verse, verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits. He just brought some fruits for him and he can do. That was the attitude. He just brought some food. He just brought some offering. He just gathered some change from his shopping at the hub. Whatever was left, he brought to the house of God. He just brought some offering. Some. It's a key word. Contrasted. Verse 4 to Abel's offertory. But Abel, Abel brought fat portions. 
in some translation, it talks about choice. Offertory. Choice. Sacrifice. The finest from his herd or flock. He brought the best to God. He offered the best. The fat, the finest of his heart. He, he was intentional. He was deliberate. He was very calculated. For him, any could not do in the presence of God. For him, God must get the best and the finest from my activity, from my job, from my employment, from my businesses, from my farming. I must give the best to the king of kings. And hence his offering found favor in the eyes of God. God was delighted with Abel's sacrifice. Cain, any can do. As long as you bring something, anything passes. Some fruits. Are we guilty of just bringing some offering? That's how we give sometimes some offering. Not the choice. Not the best. As I was preparing and praying and studying to minister today, the word best could not escape my heart, my mind, and my spirit. It brought tears to my eyes. God is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He deserves the best. He deserves the best. He desires the best. Forgiving is worship. We must give our very best, our very finest to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oswald Chambers put it more graphically this way. My utmost for his highest. He must take the best of my finances. He must take the best of my resources. He must take the best of my gift. He must take the best of my time. He must have the finest or have none. My utmost for his highest. I suspect many of us are guilty like Cain. We just bring some offering to the house of the Lord. And he can do whatever we lay our hands, whatever leaves is left after balancing and settling all financial obligations. Whatever is left thereof is what we bring to the house. That's kind Cain way of giving. Today, God is not delighted with that kind of giving. God desires the very finest that as you receive your income after the end of your financial year, when you balance your, your balance sheet and the first gift and the finest of your collection must be set aside for the kingdom of God. The finest for God. Any does not do cheap giving to the Lord. Any can do kind of attitude. That was a trouble with Cain. And God warned him. He didn't intend to punish him. Why are you upset, Cain? If you do the right thing, will you not be accepted? In other words, there's something wrong he had done. He had done something wrong. He came to worship God cheaply, conveniently. Any can do. Abel, with a sense of reference, a sense of diligence, in full realization of the glory of God, the giver of all things, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who gives us our very being, our very existence, he brought his finest. I pray from today, you begin as you prepare to come to God's house, that you will think through your giving process. You will think through your giving habit and ask yourself, do an evaluation. Do I give God my best? This goes for both finances, time, resources, energy, and all that you are. Do you offer to God the best? 
Cain was mocking God. Cain was mocking God. He thought, after all, I don't see him. I'll just drop some coins when the offering bags come. That will do for the day. And God was not happy with his offering. Exodus 34, 26. Bring the best of the fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Bring the best of the fruits of your soil to the house of Of the Lord your God. Why God? Why is God asking the best from his people? Why is God asking the best from his people? Ezekiel 44, 30 to 31. The best of all the fruit and of all your special gifts belong to the priest. You are to give them the first portion of your ground meal so that the blessing may rest on your household. Now the priest did not have any inheritance in the promised land. The sons of Levi or the Levites were designated as priests who served and ministered in the house of the Lord. Moses and Aaron and Miriam and all those descendants of theirs who are actually Levites from the sons of Levi. Those are the priests in the house who used to minister in the time, in the, in the Old Testament. So the people, of, and they did not get any inheritance when Joshua finally crossed over the Jordan into the promised land and they settled down and people began to take their plots, okay? Some people got portions of, of their land as the inheritance was being divided, but the Levites got nothing. And God said, I am their inheritance. They will not get land. I am their inheritance. But how are they going to survive? How are they going to pay rent? How are they going to make ends meet? Will they survive on, on manna or holy communion? By the way, manna ceased the day they stepped into the promised land. There was no more manna in the wilderness. There was no more manna in the land. Because in the land, they were supposed to till and cultivate. And out of the sweat of their brow and out of the sweat of their faces, they would harvest and God would bless the work of their hands. So how are they to survive? God told his people, bring the finest of your harvest to the house of God. The Levites will live off it. That will be their portion. You're very quiet. I can sense a pin dropping. Are you still here? The Levites were not supposed to grab land. get some allotment and inheritance. God was their inheritance. And as God's people gave to God the choice of their farms, the finest from their harvest, the priest got that fine portion. But the priests were also to give a tithe from their portion. The finest to who? To Aaron. So even the Levites were tithing. All right? By the way, pastors do tithe. Let me not speak for everybody. I do tithe. I will expound a bit more next week. We should tithe. The man of God should tithe. The Levites were tithing. They got the best. They didn't lavish themselves on the best. They were in return to tithe to Aaron. They would take God's fine portion and what is left, they will help themselves with the same. Come to think of it, the order in the Old Testament was very interesting. Can you imagine every day sacrifice, burnt offering, and they would take their portion. So they were having yamachoma every day. Wasn't too bad to be a priest then. <laughs> it was a bloody affair, slaughtering all those animals. As God came, uh, they offered sacrifices to the Lord. 
Let me not get distracted. The best arrested me. God is asking his people to give the best from their farms, from their businesses, from their occupation. Bring the best to the house of the Lord. As the priests receive the best, they will take 10% of their best to, to give to Aaron. That is his inheritance. They also set aside some portion to offer a sacrifice. In Numbers 18, 25 to 29, the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites the, the tithe I give you as your inheritance. Are we together? Speak to who? The Levites. And say to them, Speak to the pastors. And say to them, when you receive from the Israelites the tithe I give you as an inheritance, you must present a tenth of the tithe as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as a grain from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. In this way, you also will present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. From these tithes, you must give the Lord, the Lord's portion to Aaron, the priest. You must present as the Lord's portion the best and holiest part of everything given to you. The best and the holiest portion. The best and the holiest portion. Valley Road, the best and the holiest portion. The best and the holiest, the best and the holiest, the best and the holiest is what God desires. The best and the holiest portion. Often we have not given the best and the holiest portion. We are guilty like Cain. We need to repent. The best and the holiest portion. I believe when we give the best to the Lord, He will give the best to us. When we give the best to God, He will give His best. To us. I know he's given us the finest, heaven's darling, the finest of heaven, Jesus. But alongside him, there are many treasures. Hallelujah. If he gave Jesus Christ to us to redeem us from our sins, what else can't he give us, honestly? God has already given us his best. But when we give him our very best, in turn, he will give us his best. I think this is the promise or the, the, the blessing that Moses spoke to the children of Israel. With the best the sun brings forth and the finest the moon can yield. With the choice gift of the ancient mountains and the fruitfulness of everlasting hills. With the best gift of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwells in the burning bush. God desires when you give him the best, he will give you the best the sun can give. Hallelujah. He'll give you the finest the moon can yield. He'll give you the choices of the gifts of the ancient mountains. You'll be fruitful in the land. Hallelujah. You'll get the finest the everlasting hills can yield. The best gift of the earth and the fullness and the favor of him who dwells in the burning bush. When God's people give him his, their best, God will open his hand and give them his best. That's what it means by throwing open the floodgates of heaven and the windows of heaven and pouring blessings upon your bands until you have no room to harness the harvest. I have been praying that God will raise multimillionaires in this congregation. 
not for the sake of being wealthy and featuring in the fortune 40 or whatever, for the glory of God, that God will raise people who are endowed financially, who can support the work of the Lord, who will not be attached to material possession, they'll be attached to the Lord, material possession will only be an avenue of serving God. May God answer that prayer, may something break through this season in Jesus' name, may God raise Men and women who are wealthy in the kingdom of God. But the secret is giving your best. When you give him your best, he will give you the best the sun can yield. He'll give you the best the moon can bring forth. He'll give you the best what everlasting hills can bring to you. He'll give you the finest the earth can bring forth. God's people must learn to give God their finest. In Deuteronomy 33, 14 to 16, when Abraham was visited by three men who were angels, what did he do? He rushed quickly, fast prevailing on them to stay on until he fixes a meal for them. And so quickly he rushed and we picked the story from Genesis 18 and verse uh, 7 to 8. Then he ran and selected a choice. <laughs> he didn't catch up with the crippled one that could not run fast. And he could not do for Abraham. He ran to the herd. Can you imagine an uh, about 80-year-old man running and his clock around his face, uh, tagging along and checking around and checking around and said, no, this one, no, this one, the finest, the fatling of the calf. And he selected the finest from the herd and quickly he ran and he prepared it for the angels to eat and he challenged his wife to prepare some chapatis for, for, for these guests to eat. He offered his best. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to his servant who hurriedly prepared it. In Psalm 40, rather Psalm 96, 8 to 9, ascribe to the Lord glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Bring an offering. Bring your finest as you come to his house. In the book of Malachi, I will need to move faster. In the book of Malachi 1.8, God was lamenting against who? The priests. What had they done? They were defiling his altar. How? By placing crippled and diseased animals at the altar. The priests were guilty. They were sacrificing diseased and crippled animals at the altar. This dishonored God. God was asking, where is my honor? If I'm your God, where is your honor? My honor, how can you wash me with these unworthy animals at the altar? And he challenged to, say to them and told them, now go and present these animals to your MCAs and see if they will like them. If your MCAs cannot take this offering, how come you're dishonoring me by bringing to me crippled animals and diseased and sickly animals? God was challenging the priests to up their game, to recognize whom they were serving, what kind of sacrifice they were bringing to the house of the Lord. God was expecting the best and the finest from them. In Matthew 2, 11 to 12, when the wise men tracked down following the star from the east where Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem, they came to the manger and they found a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. What did they do? They bowed down and worshipped him. They bowed down and worshipped baby Jesus. And out of their treasure, they opened their safe, okay? Where the jewels and the gold and all the finest were. They opened their treasure and presented him with gifts of gold, of incense, and of myrrh. Very expensive, but also symbolic gifts. It is actually said that Joseph and Mary probably sold these gifts to get money to flee to Egypt because Herod was threatening the best. I could not go beyond this word, the best. I speak to you, my brothers and sisters, 
Present the best to the Lord. Present the best to the King of Kings. Giving as worship. When we understand it that way, it's not a side thing we do in the service. It's not an appendix of the, a lengthy religious program. No, 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 no. It's part and parcel of worship. When we come, we must prepare ourselves. We must think ahead of time what we're going to give to the Lord. We must set aside the best from our incomes and give it to the Lord as we come to worship Him. As it were, open our treasures and present to Him the finest that we have. Secondly, in the interest of time, Giving is an, is an expression of our love for God. Giving is, a, is an expression of our love for who? For God or to God. Giving is the most natural response to love. Have you noted, even students when they're in love, hello, you, you people need to go through that phase. When high schoolers, college-going students fall in love or begin to have some feelings, some errors, erotic, they come and go. They begin to write love notes. In our days, we would draw our heart with the arrow, arrow piercing through. <laughs> then you will go and give it to the girl you begin to, you began having feelings about you have a holy look I, <laughs> you didn't go through these things you'll give something a love note you tear it from your exercise book color it nicely and put all the fine words and hearts and hearts and and and, 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 and you give it they use their pocket money to please their girlfriends or boyfriends they give is the most natural response. You give your time. You hang out with people you, you, you feel so strongly about. It's the most natural response to love. Amy Wilson, Kamikel has said, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You know the grace of God. When we sinned in Adam, and this blows my mind, when we sinned, when humanity sinned in Adam, because through the sin of one man, Sin entered the hole. In Adam we sinned. Don't say I was not there. In Adam we sinned. Through the sin of one man, all were reckoned sinners. But thank God through the obedience act of one man, we have now been reckoned as righteous. Amen? The first Adam failed. The second Adam succeeded where the first Adam failed. But this is the point. When Adam sinned, God did not give up on him. But when angels sinned in heaven, they were never given a second chance. Come to think of it. This blows my mind. Angelic beings, when they sinned, howled from heaven. What awaits them is dreadful Judgment and judgment is coming, and hell is intended for rebellious angels, not for humanity. God never intended hell for humanity, and because of that, He gave His best gift from heaven. For God so loved the world that He gave, He loved that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish. God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave. When you love, you give. This gift was very costly because it costed the life of Jesus. He did not spare 
He did not spare his son. He gave him as a ransom for us. When you love, you give. Could it be that perhaps our love for God is cold? I shudder to imagine. When we are not faithful in giving, is that an indication of our level of love and commitment to God? I think so. I will expound this as we go along in the coming series. How you give is an indication of your love or lack of it for God. Someone has said, it may sound controversial, the spirituality of a man is not measured by how many hours he spends on his knees, but how he gives to God. The ultimate litmus test for one's love for God is not how long you stay in the closet, but how you give to the object of your love, God himself. King David gave extravagantly to the Lord because he loved him. In fact, the Bible says, as he prepared to build the temple, I'll expound this in the next point. As he prepared to build the temple, God told him, you're not going to build the temple. You've been a man of war. Your hands are bloody. You've killed many people. You cannot build for me a holy house for worship. But guess what? Your son Solomon will be the one to build the house for me. But that said, David did not say, okay, well done. See you, I'm off the hook. He said, no. He prepared the blueprint. He gave extravagantly, generously, hilariously towards the same. And the Bible tells us he set his affection on the house of God. He set his love on the house of God. It's a question of love. His giving is motivated by his love for God. He set his affection in the house of God. I will expound this in the next point. But in John 12 and 3, Mary... Mother and Lazarus were Jesus' friends. In the course of his itinerary ministry, he was stopped by Bethany a few kilometers from Jerusalem and lodged for the night. And, and, and of course, mother will prepare three-course meal. She, she was given to hospitality. And God bless every person given to hospitality. Wonderful ministry. That was mother's way of serving the Lord. But Mary was different. She would spend most of the time at Jesus' feet and listening and listening much the infuriation of, Mary, of, of, of mother and mother elsewhere complained. But that's not my point. In John chapter 12 and verse 3, Mary did a very symbolic act. She brought her finest perfume. Spikenard. Now spikenard was not found in ancient Israel or even in Middle East. Spikenard was imported from the hills of India, all the way from India. It was very, very expensive. We are told that this spikenard perfume will cost one month's year's wage. All your savings, you can do your math, calculate. You've just filed some returns, tax returns. I hope so. The gross, not the net, <laughs> the gross of your income will only buy that bottle of spike night oil. And Mary extra, extravagantly broke that alabaster jar of her finest perfume, of her finest savings that represented her wage for the whole year and poured it on Jesus' feet. And she went ahead and wiped his feet with her nice retouched hair. She had just come from the salon the previous Saturday, but she used that to wipe Jesus' feet. And the people were infuriated and they were saying, this is not right. Judas was protesting he was leading a bunch of protesters saying, what a west, what a west, what a west. And Jesus was saying, what a worship, what a worship, what a worship. Judas, what a west, what a west, what a west. Jesus, what a worship, what an act of worship. I tell you the truth, whatever the gospel is preached, what she has done today will be mentioned forever, including today. 
Judas was like, this is not being a, a good steward. He went religious. This is not stewardship. How can you waste? A whole year's waste on Jesus. How can this would have been sold to give it to the poor? Benevolence. He should have come to the church kitty to be administered as relief. Those who are in need. Judas. He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he used to help himself from the, the kitty. <laughs> he was helping himself from the kitty from time to time. An act of worship. Mary poured it all on Jesus. Her love, her love for the Lord. She demonstrated her love for the Lord. And that act was actually symbolic. It was prophetic. She was preparing Jesus' body for burial. Her finest. What a way to love the master. What a way to express her love for the master. What a way to give her very best and her very finest, the most costly gift to the master. And this had impact on Jesus. Talk about giving for impact. This had impact in the kingdom of God. It still has impact in the kingdom of God. And if you cannot talk about worship without talking about this story of Mary, how she extravagantly poured it all on Jesus. Hallelujah. I pray God will transform us to be extravagant worshippers and give us. We'll hold nothing back. We'll give our finest and our best to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Giving is an expression of our love for God. But thirdly, giving is an expression of gratitude to God. Giving is an expression of our gratitude to God. I'll go back to the story I was beginning to allude earlier. In re reflecting on the goodness of the Lord upon his life, how God had been gracious to him, taking him from herding his father's sheep to being a shepherd of Israel, how God had blessed him, and the fact that he was now living in a house built of cedar, a palace, a magnificent place, and how, on the contrary, the act or the ark, rather, of the covenant was living in tents. Now, the ark of the covenant represented the presence of God. Up until this time, the ark of the covenant was in tents. But David said, you blessed me. You brought me from the sheep pen. You, you, you brought me from herding my father's flock. You've honored me. You've elevated me. Now I'm shepherding the nation of Israel. You have blessed me. Now I'm not living in tents. I'm living in, a, in the finest house on earth. The house built of cedar. But the ark of the covenant is still in tents. In appreciating the fact that you bless me, I'm going to build you a house. He called Nathan the prophet. And he shared his desire. He shared his testimony of God's goodness and he said Nathan said go ahead. Do us. You please. That very night God appeared to David and told him you ain't gonna do it David. I appreciate in the first place your love for me and your commitment to the kingdom of God. And, and, and the way you desire that my name be honored among Israel or building a resting place for me, I honor that. And because of that, your son Solomon will succeed you. I'm going to bless him. He'll be a man of peace. You've been a man of war. I'll give him rest. I'll also give him wisdom to be able to build a beautiful house, a magnificent house for my honor. But David this, did this because of his gratitude to God. Can I read that story? I paraphrased in many words. 1 Chronicles 29, 3 to 5. In preparation for the building of the temple, you know, David didn't come to the service and found all oh, the offering is collected. Pukes, I can go back with my offering. 
God, do we do that sometimes? Some of us are guilty. Fuchs, it's gone. Although God told him, you're not going to build, he said, I must do something. My son Solomon is young and inexperienced. I'm going to do all the architectural masterpiece. I'll do elaborate plans for the house and listen to his story after doing all that in 1 Chronicles 29, 3 to 5. Besides, in my devotion, mark that word, in my, some translation says, in my affection to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above everything I have prepared for this holy temple. Verse 4. 3,000 talents of gold. Gold of Ophel. Now gold of Ophel was a top-notch quality of gold. I discovered there are different classes of gold, okay? Gold is not gold. It's a, it's a, it's a special class quality. The gold of Ophel and 7,000 talents of refined silver. Show you see silver, top class silver for the overlaying of the walls of the building. For the, for the gold work and the silver work and for all the work to be done by craftsmen. Now who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? I, I, I was arrested there. I had to try and do some math and understand what kind of giving is this in today's modern monetary terms. What are we talking about? What figures are we looking at? David gave 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of high-grade silver. This is enormous quantity of gold and silver by any standards. A thousand or hundred thousand talents of gold is equivalent to 3,750 tons. Today's value is 45 billion dollars. Not shillings. Your calculator will hang if you went that way. 45 billion dollars. A thousand. One million talents of silver is equivalent to 37,500 tons. Today's value is about $10.8 billion. In round numbers, the wealth of the first temple was about $56 billion. Blows my mind. Out of my affection, out of my devotion to my God... I have, in all my preparation, in all the other giving I have done, I have set aside my personal fortune, out of my personal fortune, these billions of dollars for the building of the temple. This is extravagant expression of gratitude to God. People have debated, where, how rich was David? Maybe he needed some lifestyle audit. In ancient times, you didn't need to do that. All you needed to do is to conquer kingdoms. When they, he raided the Amalekites, he conquered the Amalekites, and they took all their fine golds. Hallelujah. And also people paid homage to him. Some will bring gifts as they came to visit him. Remember the queen of Sheba coming with fine gifts, a trailer chariot full of Gold to Solomon. It was a practice. When you became a superpower, people had to bow to you. And under David's reign, Israel had become a superpower. So the other kingdom, as we know, the king of Tyre would bring the finest timber for the building of the temple. They brought donations. And David was so wealthy. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong. I just want to check your theology about riches. Nothing wrong. The problem is what you do with your riches. How you handle it, your attitude. He was wealthy, but he also gave generously, liberally to the kingdom of God for the building of the temple. When Solomon matures up and is beginning to build, all provision is in place. The architectural design is in place. The provision for gold and silver and all the resources, even the craftsmen who had the anointing. You know, Holiab and Basilel, 
gifted craftsmen, anointed. When the work begins, when they break the ground on that great ceremony, the resources, they had already raised enough money to buy the screens. <laughs> they had the resources together. No more harambes. People had given so generously. It quickly reminds me of another giving for the building of the tabernacle earlier. Do you know under Moses, people gave. They gave until he stopped them. That's enough. We have more than we need. I pray that we'll get to that point. I really believe we can get there. Hallelujah. Where we just said, you guys have surpassed the target, 13 million. You, you surpassed last Sunday. I didn't even realize that. Stop it. Enough. When God's people can give liberally. I believe the blessing of God comes upon God's people when they express their gratitude to God through their giving as worship to God. An expression of gratitude to God and in concluding, giving is an expression of our faith. Giving is an expression of our faith in God. In Luke chapter 21, verse 1 to 4, I read to us, as he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts in the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put, put in two very small copper coins. This had impact on Jesus. Talk about giving for impact. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. I wish we had time to stay on on this short story and, uh, and, and expound it. This was not a parable, okay? This is a reality. Jesus is presiding over a fan's drive. He's watching guys coming with their big checks and giving to the kingdom of God towards the temple treasury. And, and he said, fine, well done, well done, well done, until a widow staggers into the, the house of God with two small coins. This widow would have actually been able to put, be put on our church list for relief and benevolence. She was a candidate to receive that. If she applied for relief, we would have passed and approved that without discussion. She was poor. When the Bible says you're poor, you're really poor. Two copper coins. We have finer details about this giving. Jesus said she had given out of her poverty all she had to live on. The most natural question to ask, how was she going to live on on Monday? How is life going to go on for her? Two copper coins. All you got to live on and you're poor and you're a widow. Widows were vulnerable in the Asian society. I know we are wealthy widows, and may God bless the widows. May God bless you. We don't have widows here. They're quiet. God defends you. God fights for you. Some of you fighting your own battles. God will fight for you and vindicate you. Trust him. He will supply your need. Hallelujah. But be inspired from this story. She's a widow, and she is poor. And then she says, I'm not going to be left out of Jesus' fans raising campaign. She showed up in a new show way with all she had to live on. And this moved Jesus and said she has given the most. She has given the best. She had given sacrificially. The rest were giving what they could do with. Okay? They got some money. Okay? They gave. They gave. They gave. They gave. But her, she gave sacrificially all she had to live on. That is faith. That is faith. One of the greatest challenge many Christians struggle with, actually they don't believe that when I tithe, when I give to the Lord what he has asked me to give, he can actually give me much more. When the month is longer than the money, the temptation to hold back is real. To say I will not tithe because the month is longer than the money. We hold back. Logically, it makes sense. Even God understands. No, he doesn't understand. Go 
God does not understand. It's, an, it's a question of faith. That when I do what he has told me to do, he will do what he has promised to do. Without faith, you cannot please God. Your giving cannot please God. We must, even when we feel we are overwhelmed with many financial needs, the first thing to do is to honor God, to honor his word, to stand by his promise. Lord, I'm going to tithe anyway. I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give cheerfully. I believe as I do so, I don't know how the man's going to turn out, but I believe you're with me. As I honor you, you'll honor me. you cause the sun to give me the finest, the moon to bring forth the finest from the ancient mountains. I will not lack. I will not beg. I was young and I'm old. I've never seen the righteous beg or even ask for bread. God, you honor your word. You come through for me. I will honor you and I know you'll honor me. It's faith. Without faith, we cannot please God. Many of us disobey God because we don't have enough faith that when we give, God will keep his part of the bargain. Faith says, when I tithe 10%, my 90% that is left will do much more than the 100% that has no God's blessings. You can keep your 100%, but without God's blessings, it will go only so far. In fact, you put it on pockets that have holes. Emergencies come up, medical bills, your car breaks down, and the devil has a way of eating on that, and God has a way of just taking it away from you. The 100% does not become a blessing, it becomes a curse. I would rather keep 70% or 50% that has the blessings of God, that has the favor of God, for that will go far than 100%. It's a question of faith in God. And I believe that as I honor him, He'll honor me. I'd rather keep 90% with God's blessings than keep 100% without God's blessings. Real giving is an expression of our faith in God. God is faithful. He will do it. He will do it. I'll close with a quote from Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher in the 18th century in England, built a mega church, metropolitan tabernacle where he ministered, and God did use him profoundly to be a blessing to the church. And one of his greatest legacy is the books he wrote. He died and he speaks no more verbally, but his books continue to inspire many people throughout the centuries. And this is what he said regarding giving. In all my years of service to my Lord, I have discovered a truth that can never fail. Let me repeat that again. In all my years of service to my Lord, I have discovered a truth that has never failed and has never been compromised. That truth is that it is beyond the realm of possibility that one has the ability to outgive God. It is beyond the realm of possibility that one has the ability to outgive God. Even if I give the whole of my worth to him, he will find a way to give back to me much more than I gave. It's impossible to outgive God. God is no man's debtor. God is no man's debtor. He will supply. You give, he will supply. That's the promise of God. In conclusion, I remind us, my brothers and sisters, giving is an expression of our worship to God. Giving is an expression of our love for God. Giving is an expression of our gratitude for God. And finally, giving is an expression of our faith in God. Let's bow for prayer.